Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. It's your friendly narrator, Sue, here. And I just like to say, when I was younger, my favorite times would be when my family would gather together. I would go and play with my cousins while the adults sat and talked. But once it started getting dark out, something magical happened. We lit candles and everybody came together the children, the adults, the elders, and we began to share in that candlelight our stories, stories of the paranormal, scary things that had happened to us, family lore, encounters with monsters, all sorts of spooky things. And these were my favorite times as a kid. So allow me to light the candles and invite you wherever you may be into my living room for the next hour, your family. So please, sit, listen, enjoy. Grab a snack, grab a drink, get cozy. As I share with you some terrifying stories, some heartwarming encounters, but most of all, every tale I tell is thought-provoking. Here we indulge in tales of Bigfoot, Dogman, and a whole host of other paranormal entities. So get cozy, cuz here we go. As a surveyor, I find myself often working in the remote places of Washington State. It's a challenge, but a rewarding job that requires a combination of technical skill and physical endurance. The rugged terrain and dense foliage can make it difficult to navigate, but I've learned to use my equipment and map reading skills to stay on course. The forest is also home to a wide variety of wildlife, and I've had the opportunity to see bears, mountain lions, and even the occasional elk while out on a survey. Despite the challenges, I find the peaceful solitude of the countryside to be a welcome change from the hustle and bustle of city life. It's a privilege to be able to work in such a beautiful and wild place. And I feel a sense of accomplishment when I complete a survey and help to map the land for future use. One day, I had a job to do in the remote wilderness of upstate Washington. I knew there were other surveyors in the area where the property was but I couldn't understand why none of them had bid on the job. It paid very well, and I decided that I would take the job and the pay that no one else wanted. I gathered my tools and piled them into the truck. It was a four-hour drive to get to the location, and I knew that it would be a long day ahead. I packed a lunch knowing there were unlikely to be any places of business in that remote part of the wilderness. As I set off on my journey, I felt a sense of uncertainty and unease. Maybe it was because I had never been to that part of the state before and didn't know what to expect. The remote location of the job, combined with the long and bumpy drive, made me feel as though I was vulnerable. I was venturing into the unknown. But as a land surveyor, I was used to working in remote and rugged areas, and I knew that I had the skills and knowledge to get the job done. Even though the journey was challenging, I was determined to complete the task and make my way back safely. I knew that it would be a long and tiring day, but I was prepared for the challenge. I hugged my wife tightly, taking a moment to savor her warmth and love before setting off on my journey. The long drive north up to the property felt like an adventure, an opportunity to escape the hustle and bustle of city life and immerse myself in the beauty of the wilderness. As I ventured out of the city, the two-lane road felt abandoned and it seemed as though I was the only one on the road. The isolation was both peaceful and a little eerie, but I also felt a sense of wonderment as I drove deeper into the wilderness. I took in the sights and sounds of the forest, 
feeling at peace for the opportunity to explore such a beautiful and remote place. But I knew my only task for being there was to complete the job and make my way back home as I approached the turn that would lead me onto the property. I double-checked my directions to ensure that I was at the correct location. I rechecked my map and GPS, making sure that I was on the right path. When I was sure that I was in the correct place, I confidently turned onto the property, ready to get the job done. As I ventured down the bumpy and dusty road that led deep into the forest, a sense of unease began to wash over me. The road was narrow and winding, with tall trees towering on either side, creating a dark shadow over the path ahead. The dust from the road was kicked up by my truck, making it hard to see at times, and the deep pothole that the rain had created made the road almost impassable. The deeper I got into the forest, the more secluded it felt, and I knew I was alone and vulnerable. The trees were tall and imposing, and the air felt thick and suffocating. I could hear strange noises in the distance and couldn't tell what kind of animal it was that would make the sounds I heard. The sense of isolation and loneliness was palpable, and I couldn't help but wonder if I had made a mistake in coming here. But then I thought of the job at hand and the great pay for doing it. I also knew my reputation was counting on it, and I did not want to make my career suffer if I didn't finish the job. The journey back to the end of the dirt road to reach the property seemed daunting. Through all the dips in the road and the tight turns to the side between trees that seemed to block the access, I considered to park the truck and walk the rest of the way to the beginning of the property but to carry all my tools would be a nightmare if I had to walk too far. I kept driving. I was well acquainted with the deep woods of Washington and found comfort in being out in nature. But this job had sent me further north than I had ever been, and the seclusion of the location was unlike anything I had ever experienced. As I journeyed deeper into the wilderness, it felt like I was going into another world as I have never been into the thickness and remoteness of the forest before. The isolation and unfamiliarity of my surroundings caused a growing sense of apprehension within me, and I began to realize why no other land surveyors wanted this job. I reached the end of the road and stopped the truck to where the map had pinpointed the exact start of the property. I switched the engine off, and stepped out of the truck. I took a deep breath of the cool, clean air that could only be found in the deep woods. I unloaded my tools and readied myself for the task at hand. I was focused on my work and not thinking of anything else, when suddenly I felt a sensation wash over me, as if something or someone was nearby. I paused for a moment, looking around to see if anyone or anything was there, but I saw nothing. I shrugged it off and continued with my work, but the feeling of unease remained, and it was hard for me to shake it off. I tried to focus on my task at hand and not let it distract me from my work, but the feeling of being watched lingered, making it hard for me to fully concentrate on my job. The parcel of land was vast, and I had to traverse many acres of rugged terrain to mark the boundaries. The part of the property where I had parked was flat, but at the back it was very rugged and hard to work with. The journey was physically demanding, requiring me to navigate steep inclines, rocky outcroppings, and dense foliage. As I completed the final section of the survey, I realized that it was getting close to dusk and the thick forest had become darker. The sun had begun to set, casting an eerie orange glow through the trees and creating shadows that seemed to move on their own. I knew that I needed to gather my tools 
and make my way out before it became fully dark. That's when I noticed the forest had become very still and quiet. The birds had stopped singing, the leaves had stopped rustling, and the only sound I could hear was my own footsteps. The quietness of the area gave me a sense of unease and I knew that I had to hurry to get out of the forest before nightfall. It was hard for me to shake off the feeling that I wasn't alone, and that made it even more eerie. I had a long drive back home, and I wanted to arrive there at a decent time so I could spend quality time with my wife and children. The job had taken longer than I'd anticipated, but I had set a goal to arrive back home at least by midnight. As I packed up my tools and loaded them back into my truck, I felt very anxious to quickly get on the road back to civilization. I've heard the saying, silence is deafening, but I never truly experienced it until that moment. The forest was so quiet that all I could hear were the sounds that I made. The eerie silence made me feel so isolated that it became overwhelming. When I picked up the last piece of equipment to put in the back of my truck, I breathed a sigh of relief that I was about ready to leave and be on my way home. I reached for the tripod when suddenly I heard a whistling noise coming from deeper in the woods. I quickly turned around to see what it was when out of nowhere, a huge tree branch flew through the air and landed by my feet missing me by inches. Fear crept into my body as I could not figure out what could have thrown such a large tree branch that could have wiped me out if it hit me. My heart was pounding as I quickly ran to the truck, throwing the tripod in the back of it. But before I could even jump in and start the vehicle, I noticed movement in front of the truck. I froze, my eyes scanning the area frantically trying to make out what kind of animal I might be dealing with. But there was nothing there. Just as I thought my mind was playing tricks on me, suddenly, right where I'd heard the noise, a huge tree began shaking violently, as if it had been possessed. I couldn't believe my eyes as I watched the tree shake and twist, branches snapping and leaves rustling. I knew that I had to get out of there as fast as possible before something dangerous happened. I jumped into the driver's seat and turned on the engine, the headlights illuminating the shaking tree. But the lights also shone on the source of the shaking. And to my horror, I saw what was causing the tree to violently shake. As soon as it realized that I could see it, the creature stopped shaking the tree and locked its gaze on me. I felt a chill run down my spine as I realized that I was face to face with something unknown something dangerous, and something that I did not want to become acquainted with. As I stared in disbelief, the creature seemed to be frozen in place, staring back at me, judging by how large the tree was. The creature had to be at least eight feet tall. It was covered in thick fur that was matted and unkempt, its eyes glinting with a sinister intelligence. It had a, it had a large, pointed head with a jaw that seemed to be elongated and had a sharp set of teeth. The creature's arms were long and muscular, ending in massive hands with thick fingers that were tightly wrapped around the tree. I trembled in fear and horror as I realized that this creature was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Was I looking at a Bigfoot? My mind was racing so fast I could not comprehend exactly what I was staring at, but I knew I had to get out of there as fast as possible before it decided to attack me. I yanked the gear shift into reverse and slammed on the gas pedal. The truck tires began to spin, throwing dirt up into the air. I tried to back up on the dirt road as far as I could, but I was not going as fast as I wanted and I could barely see where the truck was taking me. I did not want to crash into a tree or veer off the road and get stuck out here with this massive creature. 
I had to turn the truck around to get out of the area as fast as I could. As I readied to turn the truck around to put it in drive, suddenly a loud scream came from where I had just been. I quickly veered off the dirt road and backed the truck between the two trees so I could be turned around and drive forward. But as soon as I put the gear in drive and started to pull away, I looked back to see the creature running towards me. Panicked, I slammed the gear into drive and started driving forward. But as soon as I was on the dirt road, I felt my back tire sink into loose sand and it stopped me in my tracks. The tire was spinning, throwing loose dirt up into the air. I was going nowhere. I was stuck. I frantically tried to get the truck to move forward as I rocked the truck to get traction. But to my horror, I was just digging the tire deeper into the hole. I watched in terror as the Bigfoot came closer and closer to me. I didn't have any other option but to stay in the truck and try to get away. With everything I knew how to do, I was not moving, digging in deeper and deeper in that hole. There was no getting away. My heart was pounding in my chest as I kept looking back at the creature that was running towards me as I tried desperately to get away. But at the last moment, when I thought the massive Bigfoot was upon me, I looked in my driver's side mirror and the creature had disappeared. I knew it was still out there, but all I cared about was getting the truck to move forward and getting out of there. I was shaking with fear and adrenaline. My mind was racing, and I knew that I was running out of time to save myself. I couldn't see the creature around me, and as I let up on the gas to see if I could hear anything on the outside, to my relief, it was silent, and I calmed a little to get my composure and think of how to get out of the situation I was in. I sat there for a moment and listened to the truck idle when suddenly I heard a loud growl and something hit the back of my truck so hard that it jolted the truck out of the hole and back onto the hard surface. Shaking and filled with fear, I slammed on the gas and drove as fast as I could out of the woods. I sped down the bumpy, dusty road not daring to look back myself, my heart still pounding with fear, my breathing labored, my eyes fixed on the road, and my mind racing with the memory of the creature. I finally made it out of the woods and back into the two-lane paved road. I knew that I was out of immediate danger, but the darkness had settled in and I was driving at a high speed, eager to put as much distance as possible between myself and the creature. The journey was long, and the dark and deserted road only added to the fear of unease and fear that I felt. It took me about two hours to reach civilization, where I finally felt safe enough to slow down and take a deep breath. As I reached the outskirts of my city, I realized that I was running on empty and had to stop at a fuel station. It was late and I knew my wife and children were already asleep for the night. I parked the truck and slipped out of the driver's seat. As I stood up, I realized that my legs were weak and very stiff, and at that moment, I felt exhausted. I walked to the gas pump, but my legs were shaking, and it took all of my strength to finish filling up the tank and stumble back into the driver's seat. All I wanted to do was get back home where I felt safe and be reunited with my loved ones. I knew that the memories of the creature and the fear I felt would stay with me for a long time, but I was just glad to be back home in a familiar place. When I pulled into the parking spot at my house, a wave of relief washed over me, and I felt so exhausted that I didn't think I could move. My whole body relaxed, and I felt numb. My arms felt so heavy that I couldn't even imagine opening the door to go inside the house. But with great effort, I managed to gather the strength to make it inside and collapse on the sofa. To my surprise, my wife was still awake and had waited for me to come home. I felt grateful that she was awake 
as I had to tell someone about the terrifying encounter I just experienced and relive the most frightening moments of my life. Her presence made me feel safe and comforted that night. A few weeks had gone by and I was busy at work when I received a phone call from the agency that hired me to survey the property in the woods. The agent and the owner wanted to have a talk with me about the property. It seemed they were concerned about my report and they wanted to know if I had encountered any problems while I was out there. I hesitated to tell them about my encounter with the creature, but I knew that I had to be honest. I explained to them what had happened and the fear that I felt. They were shocked and were not able to explain what had happened. I was informed that the markers that I had placed for the property's boundaries were missing, giving the impression that I had not completed the job. The only evidence I had of my work were the blueprints I had provided them. They also said they will have a crew go out and investigate the area. I knew that I would never be able to go back to that place again, but at least I had the comfort of knowing that I had warned them and they were going to investigate it. The agency also told me they had a hard time finding someone to go out to the property to survey it. All the local firms had refused the offer to go out in the woods, no matter how much money they had been offered. I now understood why this bid was such a high price, and why the locals knew about the danger of the forest and refused to step foot in it. I just wished someone had told me before I had taken the offer. It was a harsh lesson to learn, but I knew that I would never forget the experience and the fear that I felt. In the end, I never did find out what the investigation had turned up. The agency never got back to me with answers, and I haven't heard about the property again. I was paid for the completion of the job, even though it seemed that the markers had been displaced or missing. To my knowledge, there have been no new developments in the vicinity of the property. The experience had shaken me, but it also reinforced the importance of being prepared and informed when taking on a job. I make sure to always do my research and listen to the locals before taking on any job in the future. I may never know what truly happened in the woods that night, but I knew that I had survived it, and that was all that mattered. On to the next one. My grandpa and I were fishing on Stony Creek one afternoon. People fished there for pike, walleye, smallmouth bass, perch, bluegill, and crappie. It was growing dark when we looked over toward the south end and saw a tall, hairy man-like something eating what we believe was a squirrel or rabbit. Once it noticed us, it went into the water, leaping at least 15 feet in the air. It was huge and covered in dark fur. After a short while, we felt taps under our john boat, then something started rocking the boat, and there weren't any other boats making waves around us. The bank area is rocky and flat land. My grandfather talked to an official at the park about this, but all they suggested was that no bears were in the area, so they don't know what we saw. My grandpa said it was probably some guy in a costume, but no man can do what that thing was doing or swim underwater that far. I will never go to that lake again. On to the next one. In Baraga County, Michigan, we were scouting for bear hunting, looking for likely blind location and sign. We had walked in from a trailhead two or three miles over very rough terrain. While crossing a blown-out beaver dam, we observed three sets of very fresh tracks in mud. The largest were 15 to 16 inches in length, while the two smaller sets were 8 to 10 inches. The mud was newly exposed, quite soft, and would have filled in quickly if tracks were more than a few hours old. This is a very isolated area. The nearest year-round maintained road is 10 miles away, and it is a gravel road. The tracks were very defined and had very long strides, four plus feet for the larger tracks. 
The surrounding area was a series of steep rock ridges and hills with a small stream heavily dammed by beavers winding through. You could see where the tracks left the mud and climbed the hill, and it was in an area that would be extremely difficult to walk due to the steepness and loose rocks. This entire incident left my friend and I both quite shaken, and we left the area as quickly as possible. No other sightings or incidents occurred, but we had noticed a distinct feeling of being observed shortly before seeing the tracks, and this had never been felt by either of us before, even though both of us had seen bear and other wildlife many times. We had just strange feelings of being watched. This was very disconcerting due to the distance we were from our truck. We were looking for bear tracks in mud of recently exposed pond bottom. The area is dense forest of spruce, pine, and some hardwood. The area is very isolated and rugged, with steep hills and cliffs to 500 feet above valleys. This is some of the remote land you will find in the lower 48. It is likely there are not 10 homes within 20 miles in any direction. The only roads in the general area are dirt logging roads, and most are impassable due to non-use. On to the next one. In Benzie County in Michigan, my younger sister and I were on our way back from the hospital. She was about 20 years old. I was 23. It was probably around 2 or 3 a.m. when we finally hit County Line Road outside of where my mother lived. We were both staying with her at the time of the sighting. My mother lives in Buckley, about six miles down Country Line Road. Once you turn off the main highway, we were about half a mile or so down Country Lane Road when we were talking, making jokes. We were both very tired. I turned to say something to her, and when we both looked back straight ahead on the road ahead, I saw a tall thing literally take two steps and it was across the road. It stood approximately seven or eight feet tall. My husband at the time was six foot five, so it was easier to make out the difference. As soon as we saw it, we both jumped and said, Did you see that? We immediately knew what we both saw, and I raced back to my mom's house. Once we were back home, we recalled the details. We were finishing each other's sentences, which was very disturbing, knowing we recollected the same thing. It still seems funny to think about, but the thing had long, flowing fur. It actually looked groomed. The hair was all over its body, and it was brownish with silverish tips. The arms were very long and hung down just above its knees. The head was hunched down, and we did not see the face. We laugh about it now and still get chills, especially when we both recall how the thing was walking like it had someplace to be. It was the strangest thing. We both agreed that it was walking in haste, not as if it were trying to get away from something or some place. Rather, almost like a person would walk hastily on a city street when they are late for a job or an appointment or something like that. In and around the same area, just down the short drive off Country Line Road, an elderly man and a woman lived in a small house off the same drive. I don't think I was living with my mother at the time of this alleged incident, but as I recall, it wasn't too long after our sighting. My husband and I went for a visit to my mother's home, and my mother told me the man down the road was just beginning to head down Country Line Road, going back toward the way we were coming when we had our sighting. The story was, he was just starting to pick up speed and he was alone in his truck during the day when he had to slow down because he noticed something crouched down in the road. He had to eventually come to a complete stop when the animal turned and looked at him and proceeded to run off down the ditch and into the woods. The description of it was that it had hair all over its body, it had a puggish nose, and the chest was more bare. They said he was saying it probably stood about seven feet tall. We have had a lot of strange happenings in this area, 
even other than these sorts of sightings. I once asked a gas station attendant in the Kingsley area about it not long after my sighting, and he laughed and said, that's nothing new. It was at night time, and it was clear. On to the next one. In Alpena County in Michigan, it was on a 150-acre private property, mostly wooded with small section five-acre being clear-cut at about every five years. Bound by mostly farmland, heavy swamp, only three-quarters of a mile from Thunder Bay River. While bird hunting with my son, we heard a rustle. As any bird hunter, the gun came up, but I expected, because of the sound, to see a deer startled from sleep. Instead, I glimpsed something quickly moving between the trees, about eight feet apart, over the ferns, and barely below the lowest tree line. Admittingly, this couldn't have been for more than three seconds. This was a very quiet day with very little breeze. It wasn't so much what I saw, but what I heard. If I was deaf, I could dismiss it as a human trespasser. It was all dark brown, about seven feet tall, and running extremely fast, given the original startle. Silently through the ferns, branches, and sparse deadfall. It was not a bear. I was not a believer of Bigfoot at the time. I told myself it was a deer leaping because of the silence and upright position that covered about 11 yards. Acceptable, right? I looked down at my son and saw nothing but pure white fear in his face. Nothing odd at this location that I've ever heard stories of. Please note, I was not a believer of Bigfoot then, my son's facial expression could only be topped by my own. I was scared of the unknown. I've come to terms with what I saw. It wasn't a bear, deer, or trespasser. Through my years of hunting and fishing, I've seen many creatures, but many elude me. I've only once seen a wild bear. It happened across the highway. Only once have I seen a bobcat. I was strolling through some purchasable land, if I don't see these animals while motionlessly sitting in a tree blind, how many others haven't I seen? I questioned my son as soon as I could talk, my mind still trying to convince myself, my body shaking, and my speech obviously stuttered. He heard the original stir, but couldn't pinpoint it after because of silence. He did not see what I saw. His fear apparently came from the look on my face. He was nine years old. We've hunted together several times, and, of course, he knows me enough to know something was wrong. This 160 covers swamp, clear-cut, small field, and old forest. The sighting was 180 yards from the field, 150 yards from the cut, and 50 yards from a very mild swamp in old wood with new growth. We were on a four-wheeler path about 60 yards away from the subject. On to the next one. Do Sasquatch hibernate? This is a subject that remains to be proven. However, we believe we have solved this question, at least for our region. My interest in this project began when I attended a seminar conducted by the well-accredited Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, who is a respected authority on the Sasquatch Bigfoot creatures. Myself and a few other retired teachers of varying subjects all met over and during several different occasions while attending the most entertaining subject of the Bigfoot creatures, and we eventually formed a study group, more for our own entertainment than for any official sanctioned research. Our major concern came about after we found enough believable evidence that the Sasquatch does exist but not credible evidence had been offered as to whether or not the creature hibernates. Therefore, I took it on myself to volunteer to do what no one else in our group was crazy enough to dare. I soon found out why. One of our team has a close friend whom we will refer to as Sam, who left the world of academia to retire on a very remote property in Colorado that was pretty much central to much of the information that our group had gathered regarding the majority of the most 
credible claims of Sasquatch encounters and sightings. Our contact was kind enough to secure an invitation for me to travel up into this remote location and use this man Sam's private road through his acreage to gain access to an otherwise impossible route to a mountain canyon that was often referred to as the Sasquatch Ridge. In fact, our group is in possession of three old and out-of-print maps that all refer to the same Sasquatch Ridge Trail. Since my partner had such a close relationship with the man who we call Sam, we obtained permission to gain access to the almost inaccessible old road that we had seen referenced on the old government map as Sasquatch Ridge, and the thin dotted line leading to the ridge as Sasquatch Ridge Trail. Sam told us that the references to these animals were immediately removed before the next printing due to the fact that two two-man teams had totally disappeared over a six-month period and both of their abandoned vehicles were found at the same trailhead that their teams had used for their mountain ascent. No trace of the men was ever found. Thus, the authorities removed all reference to the Sasquatch. There were only a few of the old cartographers around anymore that had any recollection of those bygone days, according to Sam, and he allowed us to use his copy to make notations on our current production map. And my partner Roy noted, in ink, the thin line that leads up as Sasquatch Trail, and the horizontal bar indicating the ridge line as Sasquatch Ridge. There, he made a star to mark our destination. The only evidence of those lost teams was a silver-plated whiskey flask that had the initials of a doctor of anthropology who was with one of the two teams but not another shred of evidence was ever discovered, only their vehicle. It had taken quite a bit of wrangling and finagling for our team members to get permission for us to use this man's property for my search, but he absolutely insisted that there be at least two of us to make the trek, and he also made us agree to leave another two men to make a base camp at the place the ancient road stopped and the trail begins to ascend the canyon leading to the mesa far above. We readily agreed, and then we had to go through selecting those four men who would go, as it now seemed that the entire group wanted to go. Out of respect for the use of Sam's property, we narrowed the selection to a final three plus myself, whom he concurred with. We prepared as best we could, and from previous explorations that many of us had learned from, we made pretty short work of gathering our supplies, and since the first traces of the colors of fall, we were already hitting the upper mountain, where we all sat at base camp. Roy and myself, who would make the trek upward, found ourselves shouldering our more than heavy backpack and waving goodbye to our comrades below as we began the gut-wrenching ascent up the trail. Jerry and Bill were chopping firewood from an old log as we left, so they would be comfortable. Thanks to Sam's generous permission to use this upper route, we were already a day or two closer to our goal of reaching what we perceived from our research and visual sightings through our binoculars to be a huge plateau atop where we were now headed. It wasn't long before we had to make our first stop to rest our legs from the intense pain of the climb, and already the altitude was taking its toll on us both. Before too much further, the inch of the previous day's snow was making our climb even more difficult, as the light snowfall had covered the trail just enough to camouflage the loose rocks underneath. This slowed our progress significantly. We continued to climb toward a rather dark, wide area beneath a snow-covered overhang and it gave the appearance of a jutting cliff under which we might rest a bit from the light snow that had now begun to fall. The kind of flakes that seem to have a penchant for sticking to eyebrows and eyelashes, so one finds himself continually wiping them away as when fighting mosquitoes in a swarm. Not nearly as painful, however. 
Roy thought to take a compass bearing to check our path ahead with our map. However, there was some sort of magnetic attraction that eliminated any chance of accuracy. Besides that, I jokingly reminded him that the only direction that we cared about was up. As we rounded the gradual turn to our right, the trail almost seemed to be guiding us to a specific goal, as the climb was becoming easier and we were no longer having to step over rocks and boulders. A few hundred yards further, we found ourselves approaching a thick pine forest on a kind of mesa, almost as if the entire top of this tall peak had suddenly been sheared off and a thick forest had mysteriously spread it up. Even the trail we were now walking on was dirt rather than hard rock, and the dirt was thickly covered in pine needles. We now seemed to be on a well-pronounced and well-traveled trail, as we wound slowly around the peak of this low mountain toward the strange-shaped cone on top that we only had an occasional glimpse of until now. As the trail continued through the forest, I was still continually looking for what type of animals were using it, and the unnerving sight of a large and unmistakable paw print of a bear stopped me in my tracks, and Roy came up from behind me to see what I was kneeling over. We determined that it was the track of a black bear and not a grizzly, which, if it had been a grizz, I would have probably wanted to give up going further. The track was only a clear print as it was a sheltered dirt area where the snow had failed to cover it. After Roy examined the track more closely, he determined from his extensive hunting experience that it was likely several days old, and he surmised that with the sudden change in the weather two days before, that the animal was likely in a den somewhere close by, and we could forget about him until late spring. I breathed another sigh of relief as the track fled downhill toward a thick grove of pines and a jumble of a landslide that had long ago devastated an entire grove of pines. It looked like a huge pile of places for bears to hibernate within. The apparently heavily used trail slowly continued in a wide arc around the high peak, staring down at us until we once again entered another thick growth of pine and firs. The trail had now become hard to navigate, and Roy wondered aloud at how difficult it must be for deer or bear to travel such a circuitous route. And then we stopped and looked at each other, Sasquatch. As we now even more slowly continued on the trail, we stopped often to survey the forest around us as the trail narrowed and we could now once again feel the cold wind that indicated we had come full circle around the peak of this lower mountain and before we could decide what to do next, a sudden movement down the trail leading into the thicker first below us made our choice clear. There, not forty yards from where we stood, was clearly a young Sasquatch. We had both been focused on where the trail we were on went, down the hill and into the thick green wall of trees, at a point beside a monstrously tall fir tree, and at that very moment, a Sasquatch that we figured to be about six feet tall by the way it height showed it to be next to a branch of the tree it immediately retreated behind upon, spotting us as we blustered and pointed like amateurs at it. After all, there are few professional watchers, if any. We cautiously and carefully made our way down the short but steep slope and stepped into the narrow opening between the monstrous fir and another one about half as big next to it, where we found ourselves among the true giants of this well-concealed forest that almost totally blocked out the sun. It was colder now, and we had used up almost all of our daylight in our excitement, and it was even more apparent in the dark but beautiful forest. We forgot all about the Sasquatch, with night about to descend, and we fortunately found a large monolith of a fir that must have fallen from old age or fierce wind, as it lay with its trunk extended toward the steep slope. We took shelter in the huge hole beneath the root wall that had long since lost its spidery roots. 
we gathered up the aging pieces of branches and limbs that had dried over the years to make us a campfire that old Daniel Boone would have been proud of, being exhausted from the most difficult hike I had ever made. And Roy, looking like a zombie, we hovered over a toasty fire pit and stayed busy congratulating ourselves on our discovery. Even though there was only a light dusting of snow so far, we knew that not all the Sasquatch were bedded down for the winter. Reminding ourselves that our group had previously discussed at length that our goal was to determine whether or not the Sasquatch hibernate were undoubtedly against all odds as we had already seen that the animals were out and about. With the snow that had begun falling, we knew that we didn't have the time to wait much longer to find out whether or not they did or did not. We had discussed this matter at great length, knowing that the best of odds in learning the truth would be to await signs of their movement in the spring. The difficulty in that thinking, however, was that it was not even conceivable that one could be anywhere near a hibernating creature at the exact moment it comes out of hibernation in the spring. The where and when could take a lifetime of study and still fail. Gathering sticks, bark chunks, and branches, we built up a strong fire in a way that when we awoke the next morning, we still had a good bed of coals. The night had been quiet and uneventful, and as we made a breakfast, we could finally see around us the extra large hole the giant tree root had left when it toppled over. There was something different about this hole, however. On the sides of this large excavation, there seemed to be something wrong. Something just didn't fit. It was just a feeling like there was something different about the way the tree had uprooted the root on the upper stump appeared to have been cut, as the spidery root so commonly found on the uprooted trees were notably absent. As we exited our shelter, we began walking among these monstrous behemoths, and it appeared that at one time there had to have been a tremendous windstorm that hit this mountain in order for it to topple so many trees. Something, however, was not making sense. I signaled Roy to join me, as I walked further down the slope, stopping to more closely examine the fallen trees. They all seemed to have fallen in the same direction, but not at all at the same time, and this slope was quite well protected from wind by the ridge nearby, so something wasn't adding up. Then we had an idea at the same time, and as we dropped into another hole, we found that it had a soft bottom. Beneath the dirt in the floor, of the holes we now checked, we found that each contained an entire deep layer of pine boughs. Pulling up on one pile, it revealed itself to be several feet thick. We ran back to our shelter of the night before, and its floor was not at all like the other two. Suddenly, the reason became readily apparent. This tree still had a full complement of branches, and they were still green as it had obviously recently fallen. A quick check of all the other downed trees showed they all had thick carpets of branches and pine needles patched deep on the floors. We spent half the day searching this hillside, and then we went into another thick forest of several species of balsam and other evergreens that neither of us knew what they were. But in the thick forest of balsam, we found definite evidence that something had purposefully dug up the entire one side of several individual trees, and it appeared that someone or something had been working diligently at severing and smashing the roots on only one side of the trees. Then we knew that these Sasquatch had the superior intelligence to expend the effort to steadily weaken a tree to cause it to fall over, or, in the large cases, to weaken the root structure so the next strong wind would cause it to topple. Then, in the late fall, the animals would gather boughs and leaves to pile into the holes where the roots had been and await the coming of the first heavy snow while they rested under their warm blanket. We decided to spend more time in this area rather than go any further up the mountain, as had been our original plan after carefully analyzing the route we had intended to travel. Reason being, was we only had one goal when we began our climb, 
and it didn't make any sense to climb higher in search of some mystical cave or canyon where Sasquatch assembled to wait out winter. That made no sense whatsoever to even think for a minute that an animal with the intelligence of these creatures had already been proven to have would gather in a group and risk perishing together in some bitter cold cave. We began searching further, and in the dim light that managed to penetrate the thick blanket of pines, we slowly made our way downward, and we continued to find signs where certain trees had been dug out around their upper sides of their trunks, and there was evidence that the exposed roots had been smashed and cut through, and then they seemed to have been covered with dead branches and pine needles to mask the progress of weakening the uphill support, so as to allow the constant mountain winds, and to eventually finish the job, and fell the tree in the direction the clever animals had predetermined. This process of creating future shelters seemed at first to be a painstakingly slow process, but as we discussed throughout our search, the obvious slow birth rate suspected among the species would not make it necessary to rush the process, and we found evidence in several instances that were obviously more recent diggings due to the fact that there were massive amounts of needles still clinging to the branches, and that drew us to more closely inspect the massive root balls. We found that in many cases where needles remain thick on branches of felled trees, that the enormous root systems showed signs of fresh cut, which we have deduced to be evidence confirming our theory that although no longer standing, somehow these root systems may have been covered by the Sasquatch to keep them alive and still nourishing the host tree, even as it lay dormant and dying. At first, this made no sense, but then we found more evidence that something seemed to have chewed on many of these attached roots. Our first reaction had been that squirrels were actively eating these roots, but the few squirrels we had seen at this altitude had easier pickings in the safety of the tree branches, and it is common knowledge that squirrels prefer deciduous trees, so it was not even conceivable that the squirrels would risk themselves to seek out the root of dying pine trees. Having eliminated that thought, we began to more closely examine several more of these root balls, and after hours more climbing in and out of several more holes and shifting through the floors of these holes, we have reached what we believe to be absolute proof that the Sasquatch does indeed hibernate. We further state our belief that this elusive species hibernates together as a family unit. Judging from our many excavations, there is adequate evidence that these creatures, in most cases, wait until the first heavy snowfall covers the entire forest in a deep blanket of permanent covering, the young ones, due to the evidence of smaller teeth marks, will often nibble on the living root in their chamber prior to completely sleeping for the winter. This may be a way of slowly easing into hibernation until the heavier snows steal their hideaway. Further evidence helped prove our theory when the huge trees had fallen, wherein the terrain had caused the root ball to have broken all of the roots completely. These holes had no evidence of any occupancy whatsoever. We concluded that the nesting chambers of the Bigfoot are carefully chosen by them in advance, and part of their consideration may be that they prefer live root systems. We also found what seemed like piles of boughs that in each case had been torn off live trees of other species that showed evidence that the bark had been chewed off as these branches seemed to have been collected as humans would to bring nighttime snacks into bedroom. A strange analogy, but the Sasquatch seemed to have many habits similar to humans. We reasoned also that these food sources would perhaps have been to assist the animal transition into hibernation. My partner's remark of Sasquatch snack still makes a lot of sense, at least it seemed to in the sub-zero temperatures. We made camp a ways back in a patch of balsams that were out of sight of this obvious Sasquatch territory and had a rather fitful sleep, which we both attributed to being in the home of these giant creatures brought on sleep-inducing stress as we half expected to be attacked at any moment. 
we awoke to a blanket of white, an unexpected early snowfall that, from the accumulation already covering our boot soles, we took the hint and packed up to return to our base camp. This was definitely the beginning of winter. Roy agreed to my assessment as he had grown up in this country, and he said the last winter report he had heard told of a probability for an early snowfall, which this late in the season it would likely stay, so it made sense for us not to stay. The snow was falling heavier now, and both of us were entirely focused on placing our every step when suddenly Roy's arm shot out to block my next step, and as I raised my eyes to the trail ahead, a dark shape ducked immediately into the darkness of the forest. All Roy whispered was Bigfoot, and we continued where the tracks of the animal were now blending into the white blanket of snow. We knew that trying to pursue the creature would be fruitless, so we continued downward while an occasional backward glance briefly caught a glimpse of the dark shadow of the Sasquatch again stepping out to resume its trek up the trail. Having been alerted, we now paid more heed to the trail further down, and on several more occasions we caught quick glimpses of dark shapes against the now much whiter background. Eventually we made it out once more into the open where we could again see blue sky. We gave each other a high five because we had just confirmed what we had long suspicioned, that the Sasquatch prepared their winter quarters and then remained somewhat active at lower elevations until they sensed the coming of the first major snowfall of the season. And once it began, they moved into their pre-selected winter quarters at the higher elevations where they were assured that the winter would set in solidly for the season. They seemed to wait until the very last minute to assure that there was no chance of being discovered in their winter chambers. We finally made it to the low enough altitude where the snow had not yet fallen, and there were Jerry and Bill, and, as if they had known we were coming, they were all packed and ready to go. We wasted no time in heading out, and as we started at a quick pace downward, a light sprinkle of snow began to fall, as if to discourage us from changing our minds. After all, we were the only things on this mountain that didn't belong. On to the next one. I'm Dave, and my friend Al accompanied me on this trip. Even though it happened a few years back, it's still very fresh in my memory. I've read a number of Bigfoot accounts since this happened, and I've noticed that most people who have had encounters had no idea what was coming. A lot of people were surprised by what they saw, but that simply wasn't the case with us. We had plenty of warnings, and yet we chose to disregard the signs and indications of trouble. Why would we do this? In retrospect, I'm not sure, except to say we were clueless. Bigfoot wasn't even on our radar, at, and at the time, we found all kinds of ways to discount what we were hearing and seeing, at least until it became so obvious that we finally had no choice but to wake up. When we did, it was shocking. I guess that's how we humans tend to be. We're in denial until we have to accept something. Al and I were good friends. Actually, we still are, even though this incident stretched our comfort zone with one another some. At the time, we were both working as wedding photographers in Jackson, Wyoming, which can be a pretty lucrative business in a resort town like that, for lots of people want to be married with the beautiful Tetons in the background. Photography can be a tough business, primarily because everyone thinks they're a photographer, especially with the availability of good, inexpensive gear these days. Heck, you can now take photos with a cell phone that would put many professionals to shame. Because of this, it's hard to make a living anymore doing stock photography, so lots of photographers have switched to shooting weddings even though they prefer to be landscape or wildlife photographers. That's exactly how it was with us. Al and I go way back, clear to high school, in the little town of Pinedale, Wyoming. 
We became friends in our high school photography club, and even though we both went our separate ways after graduation, we met up again in Jackson at a workshop given by a famous wildlife photographer there. At that point, we were both married and working jobs we hated. We decided to pool our money and do some marketing, and for some reason, our business really took off. We became the go-to people in that area for wedding photography. Wedding photography is typically hectic and stressful. You don't get a second chance on shot, and they better be good. Four, you're recording a once-in-a-lifetime event. We worked well as a team, and Al would take videos while I did the still. So, we were used to working under pressure. Well, autumn this happened. We'd been working hard all summer, making good money, but we were exhausted, and we decided we needed a break. Our hearts have always been in landscape and wildlife photography, so we talked about it and decided to go on up to Glacier National Park for two weeks. Since it was late September, we knew the park visitation would be slowing with most tourists gone. We could do some nice day hikes and hopefully get some good photographs of the autumn colors, as well as maybe film a few bears before they went into hibernation. The plan was to rent something near Glacier, which would mean we could have the comforts of home and yet get going really early and take the hikers to where we wanted to be each day. If you want good landscape shots, you need to get out before sunrise. So you can be where you want when the sun actually comes up. Early mornings were also the best time for wildlife shots. So we rented a place for a week near West Glacier, the west entrance of the park. We then rented a small cabin at Many Glaciers for the second week, over on the other side of the park. Neither were fancy or anything, since all we really wanted was a place to sleep. We hoped to be out and about every day making photos. We were excited, as we'd been talking about maybe putting together some coffee table book or a calendar, and we knew from friends that anything to do with Glacier usually sold well. Our conversation on the way up there from Jackson was mostly about how we were going to use this as a springboard to get us out of the wedding business. We were both Wyoming boys, and... To be honest, it was our nature to be solitary. That's why we'd chosen photography in the first place. Well, going to Glacier was just what the doctor ordered, and I will say our first week was fantastic. We spent time on the shores of Lake McDonald, which is one of the most photographed places in Glacier, and for good reason. We ventured up to Bowman and Kintla Lake in the North Fork region, with good results there also. But a few days after we arrived, something strange happened. We'd hiked up to Avalanche Lake, a popular spot not far from the Avalanche campground. We had set up our cameras by the lower part of the lake when a group of hikers came by. They stopped, all excited, telling us we should pack up and get out. When we finally got them slowed down enough to make sense, they told us, They'd been up at the top of the lake just below the headwall of the valley when they'd heard a strange howling coming from high above. They said they at first thought it was wolves, but when they looked up, they could see two dark animals way up on the steep wall, a place wolves could never go. Plus, these things were too big for wolves. The howling deteriorated into shrieks, and the things started throwing rocks down the cliff. Since these things obviously had hands, the kids weren't sure what to think, so they took off, terrified. Well, Al and I, both in our late 40s, were old geezers compared to these kids, who looked to be in their late teens at that, and our first thought was that they were playing a trick on us. I mean, the whole story was preposterous, even though they were pretty convincing. But, their supposed fear was contagious, enough that we both packed up our gear and followed them back down to the campground. Once back, the kids asked us to take a group photo of them using their cell phones, which we did, 
and Al also took one with his camera. After everything was over and done, we later studied that photo, trying to figure out from the looks on their faces if they seemed honest or not, and we had to say that they did. They really seemed genuinely scared. I guess I have to say that this was the beginning of our refusal to acknowledge that there was something strange in Glacier, something we would later meet in an up-close and personal way. By saying these kids were fooling us, we denied the possibility that what they saw was real, a denial that might have saved us from what we later experienced, though who knows? Would we have gone home if we believed them? Probably not, but we might have been more careful about where we went and what we did, being aware that there were strange creatures out and about. Well, our first week was up, and as we looked through our photos, I will say we were both very pleased with the results. A lot of stunning sunrises and sunsets, as well as photos of aspen and larches in their fall colors, great shot of moose, elk, deer, various birds, and even a few black bears, though no grizzlies, but we were pretty sure we'd seen a few over on the other side of the peak. For the transition from west to east of the park, we planned a special side trip. We'd hike the Highline Trail to the Granite Park Chalet and spend the night, then hike back out over Swift Current Pass, which would take us to the parking lot at our cabin at the Swift Current Motor Lodge in Many Glacier. We would leave our car at the cabin there at the start of the hike, then ride the shuttle to the top of Logan Pass, which divided the east and west side, and was also where the High Line started. By hiking to the Granite Park Chalet, we would see some of the interior of the park and yet not have to carry backpacking gear as the chalet provided sleeping accommodation, as well as food if you pre-ordered it though you had to cook it yourself at the chalet kitchen. Granite Park Chalet is a small, swift-looking rock building built in 1914 by the Great Northern Railway as part of their agenda to make Glacier more amenable to tourists. The chalet is accessible only by hiking, and it's like a backcountry hostel. The rooms have bunks, and they provide bedding if you pay extra. It was the perfect setup for us, for with all of our photography equipment, carrying overnight gear would be a bit much for two middle-aged guys who were more than a bit out of shape. When we got off the shuttle at the top of Logan Pass and headed for the High Line, we were at first pretty disappointed, for we weren't expecting to encounter so many people there. The rest of the park was pretty empty because it was so late in the season. But I think every person who visits Glacier has to go see the High Line. But it didn't take long for the trail to clear out. For after about a third of a mile, you reach a narrow section that turns most people around. I mean, it's maybe four feet wide along a wall with a drop off several hundred feet. If you have a fear of height, you're not going one step further, even though the park has installed cables along the wall to hold on to. This section only lasts three-tenths of a mile, but that's an eternity if you're terrified. It did make for some good photos, as well as help clear the crowd. After that stretch, you hike several miles, then cross Haystack Path, which is a few hundred feet up, a couple of switchbacks, then everything else is pretty much downhill to the chalet. It's a little over six miles, and you're in the heart of Glacier with fantastic views all around, looking across a huge valley to the Livingston Range, which is very picturesque. Well, we stopped for a while after crossing Haystack Pass and let time get away from us, and having to film a stunning sunset didn't help things. But we weren't too worried, as we knew the chalet wasn't far, maybe a couple of miles, we could easily hike that before dark. We also had our headlamp, so we pretty much just moseyed along. As it got along toward dusk, I guess it finally dawned on us where we were and that it might be prudent to get a move on. Glacier is famous for its bears, 
and one doesn't really want to be lollygagging along a trail there in the dark. And just as we upped our pace, we could hear someone coming. It was getting hard to make out much, but we finally saw a man hiking up the trail. As he got closer, I could see he looked tired, and I wondered why he was hiking out so late. There was no way he'd make the trailhead at Logan Pass before it was pitch dark. Most of the trail was fairly easy, but the switchbacks over Haystack Pass might be tricky, as well as the wall by the cables. He looked startled when he saw us, then stopped, saying out of the blue, something's following me. I thought his face looked very white, though it was hard to tell in the twilight. Are you camping? I asked. Where's your gear? He answered. I was going to the chalet, but decided to turn around when I heard something growling. Growling? Al asked. Like a bear? Or wolf? It's really rare for wolves to attack a person, but being out here alone in the dark might not be such a good idea. The man replied, I don't normally hike after dark, but I got off work late. I know to make noise to tell bears I'm coming, but if you're going to the chalet, you might want to turn around and hike out with me. I work at the Lake McDonald Lodge, and I've hiked this park for years. I know what wolves sound like, and I can tell you what I heard wasn't wolf or a bear. Now, Al said, well, maybe you should hike to the chalet with us. Whatever was following you, you'll be okay, as there's safety in numbers. Bears don't like groups, better than hiking out alone to Logan. Al was obviously concerned, trying to talk the guy out of going on by himself. As we stood there, things getting darker by the moment. I could feel the night chill coming on. It wasn't a bear, the guy said, shrugging his shoulders. He sat on a nearby rock, catching his breath. I'm Jesse, he sighed. I guess I really should stay with you guys, but the idea of going back seems like the wrong decision. My energy's a bit depleted, and I tend to get a little hypoglycemic. I dug an apple from my pack and handed it to him, introducing myself and Al. He thanked me, then began munching on it. I was about ready to climb a tree, he now said matter-of-factly. A tree? Why would you climb a tree? I asked. It felt safer. As Al and I stood there, waiting for Jesse to eat his apple and get his blood sugar level back to normal, the most horrible sound I've ever heard before or since came from far below us in the valley. It's hard to describe, but others have said it sounds like a woman screaming, being killed in a most horrible way. Jesse jumped up, and the three of us stood there in the near dark, as Al said. That was a mountain lion. I've heard them before down in Wyoming. It's a very intimidating sound. The one I heard had just brought down a deer which I knew because I came across it on my hike out. If you get on the internet, you might be able to find a recording of one. Are you sure that's what it was? Jesse asked doubtfully. No question about it. I'd stake my life that that's what was following you. It found a deer for dinner instead. Let's go on to the chalet. We won't have any trouble now. I don't know why, but I was now feeling a sense of dread. Was I feeding off Jesse's fear? It didn't seem like it as he seemed pretty calm at that point. I hesitated, then said, Al, I think we should listen to Jesse and hike back out. Something's wrong. I can't explain it, but my gut says to turn back. It's the lion, Al repeated impatiently. Your gut telling you a large, dangerous predator is near. And it is, but it won't be interested in us anymore. We're not that far from the chalet. Now, let me say... That, having grown up in Pinedale, Wyoming, in the shadow of the mighty Wind River Range, home to Grizzlies, and then living in Jackson near Yellowstone, I've seen and been around my share of large predators, mostly bears. I know to be cautious, but I wasn't typically afraid like I was that evening out on the trail. I added, Al, you know me. I'm not normally afraid, but my intuition says we should go back. The conversation went back and forth for a while, Al finally convincing me that I was just feeling the effect of the lion's murderous sounding yowl. I recalled what the kids up at Avalanche Lake had claimed to have heard and seen 
but decided not to bring it up, as I didn't want to scare Jesse even more. Finally, Al convinced us to head on to the chalet, partly because we knew it was way closer than Logan Pass, and the thought of hiking down the switchbacks at Haystack Pass in the dark was intimidating. We picked up our pack and all headed down the trail, though I noticed Jesse strategically placed himself between Al and me. We continued on toward the chalet, the shadows lengthening, hiking in silence. Somehow, it seemed that the further we went, the stranger things felt. It had kind of started with Jesse's comment about climbing a tree, an action that seemed logical but actually wasn't, as most predators can also climb, something someone would think of doing when they weren't thinking rationally. It got worse and worse until it became a bizarre, out-of-focus feeling. It reminded me later of when you get out of a long bout of dental work. You're disoriented and unsure of yourself, and it takes a while to get back to reality. Except our reality kept getting more unreal. I don't think it had anything to do with Jesse personally, but I do think, in retrospect, he brought it with him, though not intentionally. I think that whatever had been following him was now following us, in spite of Al being so certain it was a big cat that was now sidetracked, feeding on a deer. Al was wrong, as we found out, and wrong in a bad way, a really bad way that he would soon take the brunt of. We've never hiked the High Line before, but Jesse had, and he said we were close to the chalet, but it never appeared. We just kept hiking on and on until it was dark enough that we needed our headlamps to continue. As we stopped to dig them out of our packs, Jesse remarked, We should have been at the chalet by now. Something's wrong. Is it easy to miss? Al asked. No. It's very visible from the trail. Even at night, you can see the inside light. But I think we somehow passed it. We decided to continue on for a while, then recoined her, hoping we just misjudged the distance, but we soon came to a fork in the trail, a branch leading off to our right, even though it was fairly dark. We could see the outline of a ridge where it looked like the trail began climbing. This is the fork to Swift Current Path, Jesse said. We missed the chalet, but it's not far behind us. How we overlooked the cutoff from the main trail is beyond me, but at least now I know where we are. We turned around, relieved, now following Jesse, but it was only a moment later that we almost ran into him, for he had stopped smack in the middle of the trail. There's something ahead, he said under his breath. I could tell he was scared, but at least he didn't try to get in between Al and me. We stood there, listening, when suddenly, far in the distance, came a mournful howling sound. Al whispered, wolf. Jesse simply said, not wolf. Then what is it, I asked. I don't know, Jesse replied, barely audible. I've heard lots of wolves, and it's not wolves. I again flashed back on the kids at Avalanche Lake. They'd heard strange howls, then seen the two black figures climbing the wall. I felt a chill go up my spine. Let me lead, I said to Jesse. We have to get to the chalet. Whatever it is, there's three of us and hopefully only one of them. I nodded to Al as I got out my bear spray, and I noted he did the same. Seeing us, Jesse pointed to his belt, where his spray was already handy, which made sense, since he'd been on high alert before even meeting up with us. How far back is the chalet? I asked Jesse. Not far. Watch for a trail that takes off to the right, he replied. I took my headlamp off my forehead, holding it in my hand, though I could more easily scan the trail ahead. I saw nothing unusual, watching carefully for the side trail. We didn't want to miss it again, as it was now almost pitch black. Fortunately, it wasn't long before it came into view, but as I turned, I caught a glimpse of something off to my left, then saw a large rock coming my way, barely missing me. It was hard to tell, but it looked to be the size of a grapefruit. I yelled something, though I can't remember what, and it's probably not repeatable anyway. Then I ducked, as that was followed by another smaller rock. 
that hit my shoulder, making it sting. Now Al was also yelling, and the rocks suddenly started coming in like hail. Whatever was throwing them was strong, as the rocks were big. Al began picking up the incoming rocks and throwing the ones he could back at the shadows. But when Jesse yelled for us to run, we did, following his headlamp up the trail, rocks lobbing in behind us. I had no idea how far the chalet was, but it had to be close or we were goners. For there was no way to even use our bear spray. Whatever or whoever was throwing the rocks was staying hidden in the trees. I again thought of the kids at Avalanche Lake. Hadn't they said the black creatures were throwing rocks? Everything seemed to slow down, as if it were just a dream. I felt several more large rocks hit my pack, and later I found one of my lenses had been totally shattered. Al also later found some of his equipment damaged, and we both shudder to think of what our backs would have looked like if we hadn't been carrying packs. I could now see dim lights ahead, and I knew it was the chalet. Jesse must have been in much better shape than we were, for he'd completely disappeared. I knew Al was close behind as I heard him say, Dave, don't leave me. When I heard him make a loud moan, I knew something was wrong. I stopped and turned, shining my headlamp back, and I could see he was on the ground. Even though I wanted to keep running, I stopped and went to his side. I knew he'd been hit by a rock. He was trying to get back up, blood streaming down his face, and I reached out to help him when I saw a big hand grab him by the leg. Either the thing's body was out of range of my light, or I've repressed what it looked like, but I'll never forget that hand. I know it was attached to an arm, but it seemed like an entity all on its own. It was this big hand with a dark leathery palm and black hair on its back. Its nails were long and thick and a yellow-brown color, as if it had been digging in the dirt. And it was huge, probably three times the size of my hand, and I'm pretty much an average-sized guy at six feet tall, not at all small. As it turned out later, after cleaning up Al's head wound, we found that it was just a surface wound with lots of blood. But his real injury was from that hand. It had tore up his pants and left several deep marks in his leg that he later had stitched up. But even at that, he now has long scars. He used to wear shorts a lot, but he never does now, as the scars make him look like he was attacked by a vampire. I was pulling on Al in one direction, and the hand was pulling on his leg, while poor Al was moaning and trying to get up. I felt I was losing the battle, and as I glanced up to see several other dark shadows coming in, I knew I had to do something and fast. I was no match for even one of these things, yet alone several, and, of course, Jesse was long gone. I held up my bear spray to take off the safety, and the minute I did, the hand let go. I knew the creature had to know what bear spray was to react like that. People have said it was a bear, but bears don't have hands like that. I quickly grabbed Al and pulled him, his pack falling from his back as I did so. Now, you can tell Al's a true photographer by what he did next, and I find it hard to believe, but he grabbed his pack, pulled his camera from it, and began shooting photos. A lot of the more expensive cameras don't have built-in flashes, but Al grabbed his little snapshot camera, which did. He managed to shoot off a dozen or more photos as I stood there dumbfounded and unable to move. I'll save you the suspense by saying these creatures vanished so quickly that only a couple of his photos captured anything of interest, and that was just some large shadowy figures with no detail. I know he would have found fame and fortune if they'd turned out. Suddenly, Whereas I'd felt as if I was walking around in a cloud, my head was clear as a bell, and I got Al turned around and headed toward the chalet. Jesse helped us through the door. Then we somehow found a chair and examined Al's wound. A guy who'd been standing on the upper deck of the stone building was aware something strange had just come down, and he asked if we were okay. Come to find out, he was one of the chalet's caretakers, and after we got Al fixed up as best as we could, the sky checked us in, and even though we were late enough that the kitchen was closed, he went in and cooked our pre-ordered dinner for us. His name was Kevin, and he was a super guy. 
Al didn't feel much like eating, so Kevin brought him some broth. Then we pretty much put Al to bed with some painkillers that Kevin kept for emergencies. Al had acted like nothing much was going on through the whole thing, and we thought the wound on his head was the extent of it. And it wasn't until the next day we found the deep scratches in his legs, his pants soaked with blood. I felt really bad about not noticing that sooner, but kind of wrote it off to the weird mind space we'd all been in that night. Fortunately, the pack horses had come in that morning from Packer's Roost, bringing in supplies for the chalet, and Al managed to hitch a ride down that way while I walked out with them. The Packer guys then gave us a ride to the park headquarters in West Glacier, where a ranger took us to an urgent care clinic, where they cleaned Al's wound and stitched them up then gave him a tetanus shot. I later got a ride in the park shuttle over to Many Glacier to retrieve our car, thinking our second week's reservations there would be a wash. But after I went and got Al from the clinic, we decided to go on back to the cabin we'd rented and just hang out while he recovered. He would need to return to the clinic several times to have the bandages changed and the wounds cleaned, and though he initially had some pain from the gouges, they healed pretty fast and his head wound was actually pretty minor, so no problems there. We spent a pretty quiet week at Many Glacier, and I actually ended up enjoying it. Al wasn't able to walk far, but we got some nice photos from the shores of nearby Swift Current Lake, and also took some nice drives to places like St. Mary's Lake and to Medicine. We stuck near the car, but that was okay, as I had no intention of going into the backcountry again, at least not in Glacier. But what was really interesting was the talk I had with Kevin up at the chalet after Al had gone to bed and Jesse was in his room. Kevin said he'd worked at the chalet for several years, but this would be his last season. When I told him what had happened, he called the creatures Bigfoot and said they were getting bolder and bolder as time went on. We were the first he'd known who'd actually been attacked, but he'd heard plenty of stories where hikers had been intimidated and stalked. Kevin's theory was that these animals were fed up with people, just like me and Al had been with the wedding business, and they were getting more aggressive. He worried about someone actually being killed, and wondered if some of those who'd gone missing in the park weren't the victims of angry creatures who felt like their territory was being invaded. This was just his theory, but it makes sense to me and I can say I pretty much identify with them. It seems like we humans are invading every place more and more, and what's worse is how we act like we're entitled to do so. It's actually pretty sad to me, even though these things almost killed Al, but maybe I'd feel the same way if I were in their shoes. Both Al and I left the wedding business and went on to other things, tired of the stress and difficult people, he and his wife moved to Casper, Wyoming, where he worked at a car dealership, and I stayed in Jackson, doing the night stocking at a grocery store. I'll retire soon, and when I do, my wife and I are moving back to Pinedale, where I hope to spend most of my time fishing, but not in any places where Bigfoot could potentially hang out, though I know they can pretty much go wherever they please. And hopefully, if I am in their territory, they'll just make some noise instead of throwing rocks. That's all I'll need to know to move on, and just a little growl or two. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, Thank you so much, and until next time, bye!